Though I've lived a life where I've never really fitted in any way, any particular way. Even now, people will still debate on what I am. People will say, oh, you're black. And then someone will turn around and say, no, but he's not black. He's not black, he's colored. And then colored people will say, but you're not colored. And then when you get older, it's cool because you've just, you've, you've lived everywhere and nowhere. You've been everyone and no one. So you can say everything and nothing. And that's really what affects my comedy and everything that I say. And if ever this comedy thing doesn't work out, then I've got poverty to fall back on. And I'm pretty sure I'll be cool there. We've only recently come out of a time when everything we could say and everything that we were allowed to hear was censored. That's the biggest challenge in this country, is for us to get to the point where people accept the fact that we're free, free to say what we feel, and really free to express ourselves. A lot of misconceptions though I have realized. People think when they say a comic from South Africa, they're expecting somebody to jump on stage wearing leopard skins, dancing around and doom ba doom ba Let me tell you a joke about monkey now. I do actually have very good jokes about monkeys, but I refrain from telling those. Yes. People have these, these, uh, these opinions of you and they, they're not right, you know, because South Africa is not uh, as third world as many people think it is. Standing in the airport terminal building, there was a woman who was standing next to me in the passport line. She looked over at me and very eloquently said, Oh my God, you talk funny. <laughs> Excuse me? She said, Yeah, you talk funny. Where are you from? I'm from South Africa. Oh my God, like Africa? Said, yes. Oh wow, like Africa, Africa? No, the one next to. <laughs> Stand up comedy as like a as an art form and as a profession has obviously only come into the fore in recent times. It developed quite late in South Africa. So it's almost like comedy is developed in waves and in each wave or each generation there's like a band of guys who have kept it going. From Mal Miller and Joe Parker and Barry Hilton, Mark Banks, some of the older guys who are still performing now. Other people who say to you, oh yes, as you get older things get better. Bullshit. <laughs> And then obviously now you have like, you know, your John Christmases and Riyad Musa, David Newton. Our soccer is shit. Now we're inviting the whole fucking world to see how shit we are. He was going to become the first pioneering black comedians. I would definitely attribute that to Kakhiso Ledika and uh, David Kahn. They got onto the circuit as the first ones and obviously had to deal with the challenges of performing to all these different audiences that were not used to one, comedy, and two, black comedians at that. This whole idea, you know, the American cultural imperialism. And I started thinking, like, can you imagine, like, whenever, like, when Nelson Mandela was, like, but a young revolutionary, if he was, like, into Ben 10 and he was, like, listening to Snoop Doggy Dogg and shit, you know, walking with a swagger, big medallion with an M on it, you know, ta -ta -ta. Over and knock the mic. 
brothers and sisters of South Africa. What's up? This apartheid shit is whack, y'all. We need to rock a revolution in this motherfucker. Fuck the police. And then that set the tone for the new generation. Trevor Noah has been uh, sort of been this young guy. He spiked, you know. He's like so. He came like from nowhere, really. For the first time, we have a comedian who is not stuck by race or ethnic group. He's from a white family, so a part of him is white. He's from a black family, a part of him is black, a part of him is colored, because, you know, his, his experiences would have included that. He's lived everywhere from the township to, like, mainstream suburbia. And then on top of that, he speaks about, what, four or five languages? play in South Africa. My mom speaks Tosa, which loosely translated means, I will backhand you so hard, you idiot of a child. So, so uh, generally I speak English because it brings back good memories. <laughs> so he can relate with pretty much everyone right across the board. And everyone right across the board can relate with him. For the South African public, I think that guy becomes like the every man. You know, he's not black, he's not white, he's just, just like, whoa, he's mine, he's everybody's. As someone who's only been doing comedy for just over two years, I don't even think I know fully, I don't even know myself yet fully. I think I'm very far from even calling myself a good comedian. I'm just okay for now. There's something about comedy, man. There's something about the fact that, you know, you can just, you can never get it right. But then black people never get a break. Ever notice that? You'll say stuff and then they'll fix it. You'll be like, yeah, that, that is when I realized that it was better for us to be part of management. <laughs> no, no, Jabu, management. <laughs> eh? It's not management, it's management. Management. No, no. Management. Go up early. Management. <laughs> Management. No, no, not with your body, with your words. Management. Management. Very good. Management. Management. Well done, Jabu. Well done. That's wonderful. You can speak so well now. That's amazing. Yeah, it's great. Oh, hold on two seconds. Yes, what's that, Sarah? Mm hmm Really? Wow. So the country's theirs now. I see. Management, Jabu. Yes, now teach me, teach me, teach me. You've got a country of 50 million people, but we don't have any real comedy clubs. If we want to perform, we have to rent out a music club, and it's on their off nights. So most people don't even know there's a show going on. We do have some comedy festivals, but these are pretty rare. And people really come to see the international acts, not to see you. You can't really say comedy's that big here. It's big corporate-wise, you know? Yeah, I mean, companies have now got into the thing, oh yeah, let's get comedians, because we've had everybody else. Okay, where will I be perform performing? Inside the aquarium. Can we go check that out now? Yeah. The faces I pull while shaving are the same ones I pull while having sex. I can't use a razor. My skin is sensitive, like our country's history. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost faced with a challenge because as a comedian, you've got to choose, well, do I want to earn a living still doing comedy and almost being censored? Because companies in themselves, they are very careful with regards to what they accept and what they don't accept. You're allowed to swear? Um, no, I don't, I don't swear, though. OK, but everybody... I swear in, like, daily life, like, you know? But I won't swear in there. I don't swear in corporates. I don't swear on stage generally. Oh. But in the streets, I'm like, yeah, fuck that shit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was one of the worst intros I've ever got. <laughs> this is horrible. One of, not the worst, one of the worst. Yeah, it was one of the worst. Am I standing in front of the projector? Do I have like Microsoft on my head? I do. Don't you want to turn that off, please?
it's not a privilege for me to have somebody say, don't speak about who you really are. We saw you do what you do, and that's why we called you, but now we want you to water that down. Just filter out anything that might be controversial. Yeah, you should have spent the day with me tomorrow, and I would have shown you, not tomorrow, Wednesday, I would have shown you corporates. Corporates that don't end. From nine in the morning until nine at night. I'll be doing corporates. Andrew's father, who was a very nice man, decided to help me out. He looked over and he said, he said, well, you know, Andrew, in, uh, in some people's cultures, they eat the food with their head. Enjoy Supergazi! Enjoy Supergazi, ladies and gentlemen. They can't do that shit to us. What the fuck? I can't do that while people are playing music in the middle of the... That never happens. If we just move stuff around? No, moving stuff is fine, but I can't have people in the middle of my song going bam, 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 to do boom, 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 boom. That wasn't that bad. My performance time in, as he, as in the contract was 7 o'clock. Oh, right, okay. Like the, the, the boss of the company, he said to me, what did he say? He said, he said, if you don't fucking get on stage right now, I'll fucking kill you. I'm starting? I'm starting. You guys at the back, are you getting sound? Are you getting sound there? You, you good over there? Everyone good? You're getting, you're getting too much. I'll... Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try cut it down for you guys. I'll try to speak from this side of my mouth. Pleasure, Mike. Every time I think I can keep doing this, and then I just, I can't. I can't, I can't keep doing corporates for the rest of my life. Africa's number one hip hop station, and I've got some exciting news for y'all out there. For the first time ever, Trevor Noah will be performing his one man show, The Daywalker, at the Lyric Theatre in Goldrie City. Trevor's been in comedy for what, two to three years now, and ordinarily I would not recommend for a comedian to do a, a one man show at the stage of his career. Normally, like a year, two years in, Yes, you might be a funny guy, whatever, but are you strong enough a comedian now to like let your opinions on the world go out there and be assessed and analyzed? That's the problem with young comedians. They haven't learned the art of comedy yet. Took me 20 years to get a start. They're trying to get it in like a year and a half, two years. Doesn't work. As a comedian, you have to develop and you know, you find your voice and you find your feet and there's a certain sort of journey that everyone has to travel until they get to a certain level. There's still so much more of his comedy that he could develop and improve on. Daywalker is gonna be about my life. You know, it's, it's, and I hope it's gonna be also about the country. I'm trying to make the show everything that I am, everything that I was, and how I was influenced by everything and everyone around me. My comedy's based on my life growing up in South Africa. So for the biggest show I've ever done, it's nice to revisit all the people and places from my past to help me prepare my material. I've never been able to write out my material. I just come up with it and then I try and perform it as much as possible and turn it into gags. Thank you. Thank you, CRB. Thank you so much. This is so cool. There's more comedians than just like people chilling watching the show. We should have just gone to each table and then just picked one person and just done like a one-on-one -on -one session and just told them the jokes. It would have been more effective. Except for you, because you were shit. But in a, you see, this is the one place where we'll say that, because it's like a comedy, you know? It's that, it's that kind of place. This is where we're honest with each other and be like, that was horrible, and you know, that type of stuff. I could be horrible as well, you know what I mean? 
and then it would be worse because I'm wearing a suit. So if I'm horrible in a suit, then they're like, what is that about? With you, they're like, yeah, but he didn't look serious. You know what I mean? So it's better. So I've screwed myself over. So it could be absolutely horrible. Could be absolutely horrible, but we'll see. Uh, so much stuff to talk about. So little time. Mm, what should we talk about? My life, maybe. I always think your life is a good place to start. In South Africa, I, I, grew up, I grew up in a world where, where um, we're very focused on race. I mean, we've only had democracy for 15 years. Everyone's got to have a very specific racial thing. You know, you're black and you're white. And then and don't freak out. I'm termed colored in South Africa, which isn't a derogatory term. In South Africa, it means something totally different. I grew up in a mixed family, well, with me being the mixed one in the family. So, uh, you know, my, my, my father is a white man, Swiss. Um, my mother is a black woman, Kosa, that's uh, born in South Africa. So that's how I came out like this. And this, this was illegal at the time, you know, you weren't, you weren't allowed to have, uh, obviously, mixed relationships when I was born. Obviously, my mom and my dad were rebels, you know, they had that whole vibe. And my mom was obviously aspirational. She was like, yeah, I'm going to get a white man, yay. <laughs> you know? And then my dad, well, well, you know how the Swiss love chocolate, so I mean, you know. I don't, I don't think my parents considered me at all. I don't think, I don't think they spent one second thinking, what color will our child be? I wanted a child, and I thought, and uh, I then asked him, let me have a child, no strings attached. He didn't like it, but he, he did it. Marriage was not in my agenda, because uh, those days uh, it was illegal to, for black and white to cross color and be, and be married. Laws of apartheid did not allow that. I don't even know a definitive date of when my parents split up. I just know that I stopped seeing my father when he moved to Cape Town. I said, should you want me to help you with anything? Please tell me. The kid said, help me to find my father. I think that the last birthday card was 11 or 12. He's no longer going to see his father, that was it. I had my plans, and I'm sure he had his plans, uh, so I couldn't move to Switzerland. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. If I had my choice, we would have moved. <laughs> would have Ooh, moved. You would have missed on the sun, sunny South Africa. <laughs> sunny Africa. <laughs> no place like home. <laughs> I live to the full. Enjoy. Go recklessly. No reserves. No regrets. You learn. You live but once. That's how I know I don't cry about the past. I'm very grateful and I'm at peace with my past. Let's not lose who we are. I agree. Ah, what do you mean? I agree. Did I scratch your sweetheart? Mm. Oh, excuse me, Baba, sorry. And this is my brother. His name's Andrew. Seven years old. All he does is just like nothing. He just likes breaking the rules. Unbelievable. See the criminals in South Africa, it never ends. It just never ends. That's why us honest citizens have to just try and, you know, quell this. We just gotta try and, we just gotta try and stop the crime. But what do you do when the crime starts at home? I mean, every black family, you got, you got at least one brother that's gonna go behind bars, you know? Yo, I'm just saying, I'm not trying to be that cat, son. I'm just not trying to be that guy, man. Yo, but I'll visit you, yo, you know what I mean? I'll see you when you're there, man. Isaac! Oh, did you pump it? Did he pump it? With what? Your answers seem so simple. Oh, okay. His name's Isaac. He's a 75-year-old man. He's part of a failed experiment to try and create human beings to be younger. They succeeded, but then he lost all his memories, and now he thinks he's my little brother. I don't have the heart to tell him. 
that he's actually a 75-year-old man. I don't know if you think he can't hear me right now. He forgets this every 15 seconds. He's got like a goldfish memory. Yeah, I call him, I call him Pops. <laughs> so, I'm on a roll. Will I find you here? Yeah. Okay, I'll see you when I come back then. All right, sharp, Isaac. Yeah, I used to I used to drive one of these on the same route. When I was driving a taxi, I was 22. It's not the easiest gig in the world. And in the end it got it got it got hijacked, you know, got stolen. So I'd say a few months later when I got into comedy. I think it was about the second time I'd actually gone to watch comedy live. And we, we were at a comedy club and it was a quiet night. And you know, my friends were like, yo man, why don't you go on stage? And I tried out, I did five minutes. It was cool being the only colored kid. I remember on the white side, they treat me special. Oh, look at him, he's got a natural tan. <laughs> on the black side, they're a bit more crass. Ooh, it's delicious, this one. Hello. You know, it's it's a strange feeling, but it's like I it's like I'd always been there. If that makes sense, you know, I didn't I didn't I didn't get on and feel awkward. I didn't get on stage and feel like I didn't know what to do. It just came naturally, and I just felt like this is where I should be. This is what I should be doing. In any industry, in anything, there's politics everywhere as there is politics in, in comedy in South Africa, you know? Imagine, comedians been performing for 10 years, right? And so you've worked, you know, you work your butt off to get to a certain level. Then you get some kid who's been in the business for a year, two years, gets on the same stage as you and buries you. I think a lot of the older guys are threatened by the newer guys. There's evolution, right? At the end of the day, the propeller, like, aeroplane is always going to be looking at the jet engine going, motherfucker, you're taking my business away. Trevor Noah, very talented guy, arrogant. The arrogance that this man shows is ridiculous. I mean, you know, because I don't mind self-confidence. Everybody, we're all in this business. You have to have self-confidence. But there's a thin line between self-confidence and arrogance. When you step over that, that's when the shit begins. It's hard to say anything about Trevor he hasn't already said about himself. The timing of his life and his ability is like the perfect intersection. He's got to respect that. To me, he doesn't do that yet. So I don't see Trevor, and this is going to sound fucking arrogant, he's not a comic as far as I'm concerned. Do you have any thoughts on Trevor as well? Can you just switch the camera off quickly? I've heard everything these guys say. I don't have time for that. I live my life. And that's it for me, I do what I do. Day Walker, I uh, actually saw, saw the posting, uh, the billboard, when I was going to Soweto. The Day Walker, sounds quite interesting. Well, I don't know what the Day Walker means. But is it similar to, what's his name, uh, the um, vampire whole story, yeah? I think it would be um, talking about all sorts of people in our country and just the random people that you find on the street and the things that would happen. So that's what I'm thinking, it sounds good. South African comedy, it's still very much a growing industry. Those of us who are in it, I think, besides obviously sustaining a profession and careers and making money from it, we also have the dual role of actually developing our industry at the same time. The major obstacle that we face as comedians is that there's so few comedy clubs. I have met people 
and they say it's the first time I've ever come to a comedy show. I've had that more than enough times. And I go, shit. What scares me about Daywalker is not doing it right. And that's pretty much it, man. It's just so huge. But we don't know what one-man shows are really in South Africa. Not on a wide scale. I mean, I've never been part of something this big in my life. You know, it's, we're starting something new. People hate on Trevor, but they don't realize there is a need for Trevor to open it up for everybody. Then when I do my one-man show, then people will go, oh, it's a one-man show. Remember that thing Trevor Noah did? Dave is doing it now. If people don't like your one-man show, it's not just you that they'll blacklist. In South Africa, you represent the industry every time you go out there because stand-up comedy is still so new here. It's still so small. So if you're bad, then we're all bad. Thank you very much. How you guys doing? Good, thank you. Hey, Malume. Come on. I'm a banana. I'm a banana. Let's give some. Shop shop Malume. Ah, we love bananas in Africa. <laughs> One, two. Welcome to the daylight, bright village of slums. Let's walk through this progress of poverty while I be killing them drums. Mr. Dave Walker, Rocco, sick author, rip up a flow with my nigga Owen. When we lived in Hillbro, which is downtown Johannesburg, I lived in an all-white neighborhood with my dad, but I had to stay with my mom and my mom had to act like she was the maid, which was really strange for all of us. How are you? I'm good, man. You know, I used to stay here. Yeah. That's the Hillbro Tower. That used to be the tallest structure in Africa. This used to be like the symbol of like our success. And now it's almost become the symbol of the inner city and its demise. Watch out for the evil that creeps. When apartheid ended, people panicked. They just panicked and they ran away, like all the white people. Some of them even left their houses. They didn't even try to sell them. They literally dropped everything and they ran. This seems ridiculous, but this is what they did. Because everyone ran away, there was no regulation of this, because now you just had all these empty buildings. So now what you had was a sudden influx of black people into the inner city. It was a free-for-all, it was chaos. The inner city just became, it, it just became decrepit, you know? And then, I mean, it's a bit better now, but it just became like a slum now. Every single time elections come up in South Africa, people always start to panic, you know? Ever since our first democratic elections in 1994, Nelson Mandela was about to become president, people started panicking. You remember that? There were people, you'd hear them, I'm leaving, I'm going to Australia. <laughs> I'm going. It's been fun, Mary, but it's time to go, hey? It's time to go. We're gonna take over now. And then Mr. Mandela became president, and they all stayed. He's a wonderful man, wonderful man. If it wasn't for him, I would have left, hey? A wonderful man, yeah, he's really great. Next elections came, Thabo Mbeki was about to become president. People panicked again. I'm leaving, I'm going to Australia, I'm going. I swear, I'm leaving Mary, hey? Now that Mandela's gone, you know they're gonna eat us. It's time to go, I'm going, I'm going to Perth. And then Thabo became president, and once again, they all stayed. He left. Then it was Khalima Mutlanti's turn. Yeah, in and out. <laughs> that was so cool. People panicked then, didn't they? I didn't even fight! I didn't even fight! I can't believe it. One minute I go to bed and Tabo Mubek is president. And the next thing I wake up and we've got Mutlanti. I can't believe it. I'm going to Australia. I'm going. <laughs> Oh, and then it was Jacob Zuma. Ooh, the original boogeyman. Yeah, that's when you heard people panicking. Things were different though in South Africa, because for the first time in our history, you heard black people going, Ish, how much is that ticket to Australia again?
Get your pockets right, son. Get your pockets right. This is where you must watch for pickpockets, son. Yeah, this is where I grew up, all over here, you know? This is where I used to come and play with my mom. This was the park. This was like the spot to be. I used to chase pigeons here when I was a, a young and Yeah, I kicked them, but they were asking for it. Everyone walked individually, and then we'd meet up at like a rendezvous point. I had a, a colored woman who'd walk with me. Someone who looked like she could be my mom, and then that's how we used to roll. Well, because of the laws of the land, you know? You couldn't walk with a mixed family. There's no, you shouldn't even have a mixed family. I wasn't even supposed to exist. I was like Project X. If you're a mixed race child from a, a black person and a white person, then, then you are colored. That's actually a racial group. I always say I'm colored by color, but not by culture. Because in South Africa, they are an actual culture. Mixed race people from the very beginning, from the time of the Dutch settlers, they stayed together and they made their own culture. They became their own people because they weren't allowed to mix and diversify. South Africa was so segregated into the different racial groups that to have anyone that's not the same color in your family is, a, is a, it's just such a ludicrous thing. So, I mean, in the township, a lot of people don't believe that my grandmother's my grandmother. She tells people. I'm sure they think she's senile, you know? My brother would tell people, he'd be like, that's my brother. And then they'd be like, it's not your brother. Why is he not the same skin color as you? Because it's just very strange in South Africa to have any sort of mixedness in your family. It's still very new. So I grew up in a country where I look like a certain group of people, but I'm not like them. I didn't grow up like them. But the people I did grow up like, I don't look like them. I don't even like the term color. I like to think of myself more as like a, a BEE baby, you know? <laughs> yeah, you laugh, but it's true, because I'm like mixed, you know? I've got like a percentage share, like it's that type of thing. It's like a whole deal. And I know some people get picky and they're like, oh, well, if you BEE, then who's got more shares? Are you 51% white or 51% black? And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I think, I think sometimes I'm 51% I'm black. I, I generally think that. Although I must admit, sometimes when I go to the toilet and stand next to men from Venda, I wish I had a little bit more black empowerment. <laughs> but uh, I'll plant the tree, you know? See the Venda guy at the back there, he's like, Munda. <laughs> Did you hear that, baby? <laughs> and you thought I had two legs. I went to the UK not so long ago. That was interesting. Got out there, I was doing a few shows, and while I was, I, was, I was backstage at one of the comedy gigs, and I was talking to a comedian, and he was, he was really interested, and he was like, oh, that's amazing, Trevor, that's amazing. So tell me, where are you from, yeah? Where are you from? I said, well, I'm, I'm from South Africa. And he was like, ooh, South Africa? That's amazing, yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I said, what, are you Zulu? <laughs> and I said, no, actually, actually, I'm not Zulu, I'm, I'm colored. And he said, oi, don't say that. That's racist, right? That's racist. Don't call yourself coloured, right? That's a racist term. Nobody calls themselves that, and you shouldn't either, right? You're free here, brother, you're free. <laughs> don't call yourself that. It's not, it's not as right, it's not right, all right? Yeah, don't call yourself coloured, you call yourself mixed race, right? Mixed race. <laughs> That's the PC term, mixed race. Yeah. On the flip side, you come to South Africa and say to a colored person, excuse me, are you mixed race? They'll probably be like, you're massive mixed race. <laughs> so you must be careful. For a new comedian who's still developing or who's still sort of making his mark, a lot of theaters are rather reluctant, you know, to take the risk and say, what, just a one-man show, just you on your own? We were lucky enough that the Lyric Theatre, which is probably one of the best theatres in the country, you know, they were in between productions and they said, okay, look, we got two days, so if you guys think you can sell two shows in that time, go ahead and do it. Which bar does it drop from? If you look up there, I've already put the curtain up. I'm not just performing on this show, I'm producing the show myself, so if things go bad, it's all my fault, it's on me. People don't really buy tickets. Well, most people don't buy tickets until the day of the show. So you don't even know if you've sold enough until you literally walk out onto stage. It's just you, you know? You can't blame it on the show if things don't go well. You can't do it again. I, I, I don't think I ever fully comprehended how 
how scary that actually is. Let's stand up, let's stand up, come let's on. Go. Prime time struggle, the land where you find trouble through jacks off my backyard is how I define rubble. Under apartheid, people of color were forced by the white government to live in impoverished townships. So there was no, well, I feel like living in, no, 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 no. You live in the township. So we're talking black people, Lanasia, Indian people. Your color determined where you could live. So it was built in such a way that if, if they needed to, they could block off all the exit points, because it's like a base. So they were like, if the black people ever get out of hand, we'll um, get our airplanes and we'll get all of that stuff, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll blow these people up. The inner so is sick and the average kid back then jumped protest. My comedy is based on memories. A lot of my comedy is from when I was in the township. You know, when people say to me, why do you go back to the township? I don't go back to the township. The township is part of my life. It's, 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 it's a place where I lived. And it's, and it's a place that I lived not because I wanted to, but because as, as a people, we were forced to by the government. So I don't go back to the township. I go to visit my grandmother. So this is it. This is, this is where I grew up. As you can see, my granny balling. She's got a wall. Yeah, you know you gotta, got, you gotta have that wall. It's like MTV Cribs. Yeah, you know you gotta have that wall. You gotta have that painted gate, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. That's right, we be rolling like that hard. This is the township. This is how we used to do it. This was my driveway, but we never had a car. It was just like a cool thing to have. If you had a driveway, but you didn't have a car, you were ambitious, that was the key. Yeah. We started running out of space, so people would move in, and then they'd pay rent to you to like fill up the area. So this was our house, then everyone lived on the outside. This is the toilet. This is the most horrible thing ever, ever invented. Because you had to come outside, so you never wanted to need the toilet late at night. No. Because then, oh, there's someone in there. Sorry! <laughs> you see, that's what would happen, and then you'd be like, no, and then it's exactly the same thing. Sorry, Coco. Sorry, sorry. We didn't know there was anyone in there. We didn't have occupied. And then this, this is, this is my number one lady. <laughs> this is my number one. This Shorty is my grand. Yes, yes. As you yes. can see, I got my height from her. <laughs> this is my grand, Francis Noah. How old are you now, Coco? Eighty-two. Eighty-two years old. She still works. She still, she still catches all those taxis that you see. She doesn't want to retire. She, she wants to work. She still floor. cleans. Yeah. This is my grand rock and roll. Eight, and rock Eighty-two and years roll. old. Eighty-two years old. Eighty-two years old. <laughs> 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 you like I you Don't. <laughs> yeah, my grand. She just said he was naughty. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Hidings, hidings. I got. Where's cool. your car? It's outside. I'll show it to you. Mm. It's safe. It's, <laughs> it's gonna be fine. Did you leave somebody that car? No, it'll be fine. They can't steal it, Google. Are you sure? Mm, they can't. Is there magic there? Mm, there's no magic. They can't steal it. Huh? <laughs> You'll be surprised. <laughs> no, they won't. And people are watching it. There's so many people there. So many people? Do you know what type of people are those? They might be hijackers. <laughs> ah, Trevor. Google, you worry too much. Did I sleep in this one? I don't even remember which one. I just remember getting hidings in here. This is, this is the bedroom. This is like it. Everything. And you had to make do. And uh, you would live, maybe two of you or three of you could live in here, you know, if family needed you to. This is where, this is where it all was. So mm. there were like eight of us, eight or nine of us that used to live. Eight, mm. nine, sometimes ten, depending on who was. So we'd sleep here a lot. Like you'd sleep on the couches. And kids. Kids. Yeah. We used to sleep on the floor here. On the couch and on the floor. It was very normal, it was just like, you know, that's, that's what we did. And everybody was so happy. So yeah, so this is it. That's as small as it is, 10 people living here. I mean, this was it. You think like such memories, I think I might cry. Wow. <laughs> Don't cry. No, I won't cry, because the camera's on and now it's still the book, you know? Yeah. Oh wow, that's still up to in everything, give thanks. Because you can't buy life. Gogo, let me be off.
please, you walk me out so that they don't think I just walked in by myself. <laughs> let, let them see you with your grandson. With my grandson. Mm -hmm. So that they say that. I've got to be on there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter which side. It doesn't matter which side you're on. We're still dealing with trying to reconcile all these races and ethnic cultures into one society. So that's why it ends up being subject of choice for so many comedians, you know. And also comedy is about conflict, human interaction and conflict. Yeah, so like if like a black person and a white person try to kiss, then these guys in uniforms would come and kick you. <laughs> but then like, but they wouldn't just kick everyone, they just kick the black people. <laughs> And then they tell the white people, don't do that again. <laughs> I know it was a mistake, so don't do it again. <laughs> you! Ooh. There is a need to use your voice to tell your audience what they feel, and then you can sugarcoat it because you tell it in a joke, even though you're telling the truth. We can talk back, we can say, look here, man, this is not the way to do shit. I become a voice for people who sort of voice this. If you call, you could not give a fuck about global warming. Because what is global warming? Ooh, if we don't save the earth, ooh, then we might die in 200 years. Poor people are like, yeah, but if I don't eat now, I'm going to die next week. Next week, that will be my ass. Next week, I will fuck. You want to be heard. You want to be heard. I think everyone wants to be heard. I think people who, who hide behind facades and, oh, don't say this, don't say this, it's like rubbish, man, come on. The truth, the more we, we tell the truth, the quicker we'll get to the, the front of the line, you know, the better, the better chance we stand. That's the problem with South Africa, is that too many people don't want to admit the things. So they don't want to admit that shit is wrong. They don't want to admit that there's still massive levels of poverty. They don't want to admit that AIDS is, a, you know, is, is something that's destroying the nation. They just don't, nobody wants to admit anything. We just want to live in this hoo-ha utopia world and it's not like that as a comedian you've got you've got the platform to tell the truth you've got to be that guy out there saying those things and i mean i mess around a lot of the time you know i'm not even the guy i always admire like loisa for that because loisa is the kind of guy who says that <laughs> it was crazy and i was walking down long street during uh, the campaign time i was walking down long street and i was walking and i'm walking against the traffic <laughs> and i can see these da posters and I'm thinking, well, it's a one-way street and I'm walking against the traffic. <laughs> that's a cock plan, right? <laughs> then I thought to myself, who will, I mean, that's how you lose a thing, you know what I mean? What about the people who are driving? They don't see the posters. It's only the people who are walking against the Then I thought about it, who votes for the DA anyway? <laughs> Paranoid white people, they drive around like this.
white Cape Townians still fear coming to the township. There you meet someone and they're like, I've never been to the township, I've never been to the Guleta, and the person lives right across in violence, it's like 10 minutes away. You know, I don't know what they're scared of. I don't know if they expect to find, I don't know what they expect to find. It's an invite to why people are freaked out about the girl. Check it out. It's cool. It's cool. You might like it. You actually might want to move. <laughs> Settle down with the kid. I'm from Cape Town, man. I grew up in, in, in Gugule, too. Yeah, man. I grew up there, man. I was actually uh, back there today, man. It was, it was quite cool. Do you white people know what Google Eto is? <laughs> well, you should know you put us there, motherfuckers. But they mustn't give me this bullshit about, oh, it's the first time to be able to speak. Bullshit. These guys were about one or two years old when, when, we, when we had the transition. They had 15 years. Maybe it's a therapeutic thing for them. Maybe it's good to talk about the apartheid thing. Um, but when do you say enough is enough? The black and white experience, it's enough now. It's gone, it's finished, we must get past that. A black guy will get up and one of the first things, so, you know it's like when we're in the townships and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like a guy gets chosen because he's a young black South African, not because he's a proficient comedian. They have BEE policies, they have to hire black people or colored people for black economic empowerment. They all went to public, uh, private schools, you know? So they mustn't come bullshit that they were previously disadvantaged. Like sometimes you'll tell a joke and then you get like a, a racist crowd that'll laugh at and taking it the wrong way. It's because of a party. <laughs> because we, you can't blame this shit the old. Fifteen audience. years. This shit only was fifteen years. Yeah, ago. but it ended fifteen years ago. But then you must remember, it's not like it's instant. Do you know what I mean? It's not instant. I don't understand. People always say, "Hey, you, you black people must get over this apartheid shit." No one in the world will go. Yeah, you know, you know, you choose. You must forget about this Holocaust. Ah, please. You know what I'm saying? Because with atrocities, there's no measurement. There's no instrument that measures how much an, an atrocity or how is. You don't go, ah, oh, the Holocaust was worse than Bosnia. Bosnia was worse than. You know what I'm saying? You just have to respect it. In South Africa, we've always suffered from segregated audiences. It's always, is it a white show? Is it a black show? Is it a colored show? Who's going to come to the show? There's so much we share in common that we don't even realize. And when you laugh at the same things, you start to realize how much you actually share. Every show is like, who's the audience gonna be? I just want it to be you, you South Africans, not even South Africans, international, just human beings. You know what I mean? Just, just if you're human, come to the show. I'm not saying dogs mustn't come, but I'm just saying, like, if you're human, you know, just come to the show, that's all I want. I don't want it to be about age or race or religion or anything, it's not about, it's about people. Jacob Zuma was supposed to be the craziest president South Africa ever had. It was the only reason I voted for him. <laughs> it was his madness, and look at him, he's come in, and he wears a tie and a suit, he stopped singing. He's got a cabinet that looks like they know what they're doing. He's gonna fight corruption, and he even fired Manto Shabalalam Simang. <laughs> I was expecting a madman, a crazy guy, someone who was just gonna throw the country away. And look who I got, someone who's actually doing their job, I can't believe it. Once again, the ANC has failed to deliver. <laughs> I wanted Jacob to be wild. I pictured this guy walking into parliament four hours late, not even wearing a shirt, you know, his tummy hanging out, walking in there wearing a little plastic crown, busy singing to himself. Helen Zilla and the other guys in Parliament losing it. Jacob, you're late. You can't just come here. You can't come four hours late. Hey, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> hey, shut up. Hey, late for who? Late for who? Late for who? It's my time now. <laughs> hey, hey, shut up. When... Yeah. <laughs> Thought he was going to be crazy, you know? Helen and them fighting with him. No, Jacob, you can't just run this place the way you want. Jacob getting angry, whipping his penis out, hitting on the forehead. Pa! No, because I mean, it's not sore, it's not sore. It just makes that sound, you know, like, you know, like that. It's not, and I mean, like, what are you gonna do if someone does that to you? Like, what, are you gonna go to the police? Like, what do you, what do you do? What do you tell them? I mean, is, is it assault or is it sexual harassment? How does it work, you know? Is, I just, you never know. I mean, what do you even say at the police station? Can you imagine walking in there and them asking you that question? You'd be there, and then? 
Who hit you? Who? With what? On your head. Just, just tell this guy, tell him what happened. Tell him. I'm not laughing, I'm not laughing. Hey. Yeah. Either you are very short or he's very gifted. Eh? And you can't, you can't start with a sex gag. You must, you must start with gags that tell us who you are, like first. Why don't you introduce yourself? It takes like a second. But to say good evening. Yeah. I always wanted to get it, get a laugh in the first 30 seconds. Yes, but, so either then, that but not a sex laugh though. It's just very like... Alienating lots of people. Like it yeah. Just, it doesn't work for all the crowd. All the like if my mom was watching, then she'd already be thrown. She'd be like, ah, oh, this guy. Because you're the king of like short gags. You, so you've got the luxury of bringing your gags, just giving, yeah, like have the, the right intro, yeah. So sex must be like in the middle. Yeah, middle of the set. And it must be in the middle after a gag that kills. Dude, it's like a horrible gag is like a horrible girlfriend. You'll keep doing her until somebody tells you to stop. No, but these guys are the blazing. They stop, 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 stop protecting her. She's not good for you. <laughs> just leave it. Just leave it. She's no good for you. See, like, uh, this was just unnecessary. I think you must say it like, like it's a sad thing. That's where you, the yeah, sad emotion sad comes in. So you go, you, this is you, you go, and you, know what you, go, I'm, what I'm just you say, I go, they opened the sperm bank and I got really depressed. You, you, you gotta say that. But then I'm smiling when I'm saying it and that's weird. Or you think that's funny because I'm saying that I got well, really depressed. You're a depressed. comedian, you can but smile then... while people are dying as a comedian. You can be like, my grand died. <sighs> <laughs> you can, as a comedian, you can do all of that. They never believe you anyway, so. Like, like, like when my mom, my mom got shot when two weeks ago, my mom got shot really? in the head. Yeah. Then when I said it on stage, everyone was just like, <laughs> then they, they don't. What happened to her mom? She got shot in the head. She got shot twice. She's like the road here, Seventh Avenue. Wow. Yeah. Like, Whose mom? My mom. My younger brother phones me. He's like, Trevor, where are you? He says, come to the, the hospital now. So I'm like, okay, something's obviously wrong. But I think something's wrong with him. Then he says, mom got shot. And then he's telling me the story. The guy, he came out, he, she was on the street, and then... The guy shot her. The guy shot her in the head. I was just freaking out. So I drive to the, the clinic, I get there, and there's just blood all over her face. It's just like a, you know, like it's just open, there's just blood everywhere. You know, like she sees me and then she's like, oh, she's like trying to talk, and you know, I'm I'm just like, whoa, I'm just, I'm gone. I love, I love South Africa. I really do. I love this place with all my heart. And then this was the first time when I was like, I'll leave. Well, obviously, I was, I was surprised that, he, that, he, that that happened to his mom. I don't think he intended to talk about it. I think that the conversation just lent itself to him outing it. Yeah, I mean, that's something you want to tell someone. You'd be choking yourself by not telling someone that. My dad's killing was 11 years ago. My, my dad was shot and killed, like for a cell phone. Which again, it was, you know, how to show the, I wouldn't say how common it is, but how these things happen in South Africa, but it's not, it's not uncommon. We desensitize to crime. People get like a loved one killed or shot to get whatever. Sure, the, the personal tragedy is big, but it just seems as if we all, we all just get back on with it. After my mom was shot, 
she's the one who basically go in, no man, things need to keep running, things need to get, keep going. Cause she was in the hospital and, and I, was like, I, I was like, I can't go make people laugh after this. I was like, you know, I have to, I have to chill with you and stuff. She's like, no, you need to go out there and make money. I was like, forget money. And she was like, no, no, maybe now's a good time to tell you I don't have medical aid. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. Okay, I was like, okay, maybe I should go out and make some money. You never put something like that behind you. I can't wait. I shouldn't wait. Why should I wait? If anything, an experience like my mom getting shot shows you why you shouldn't wait. I've got to go in and do the show. The daywalker, no, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. The daywalker. No idea. No idea. Yeah, I don't know what the day will come with. <laughs> the one president that was always the furthest from being crazy was Nelson Mandela, you know? And I mean, Mandela recently turned 91. I, I just can't help wondering to myself, when you turn 91, wouldn't you throw this huge party? You know, I mean, you're 91 years old. I, would, I don't know, if I turned 91, I'd get wasted. <laughs> I'd just be that guy, you know? You have all these famous people visiting you. I'd throw this huge party, knocking down the tequilas, having a good time. But I know people never want to think of it. No, Mandela doesn't get drunk. No, people don't want anything. They're like, no, Mandela doesn't fart. His bum just suggests things. He's got that vibe, you know? But I mean, he's still a man at the end of the day, you know? I would have loved for him to just let loose and get totally wasted on his birthday. It would be so crazy seeing my diva pop out like into the garden, you know, out of nowhere, his shirt open. There he is, one of those colorful ones, him walking around, ah, ah, ah. Ah, uh, no, love me, cross, I love me. Love me, I'm fine, ah, uh, uh, I'm fine, ah, uh, uh, I'm, f do you know who I am? Do you know, ah, 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 don't touch me. Who are all these people, who's, who's that? Ah, uh, Bill Clinton, Bill, come, come here, come here, Bill. Come here, Zappa, Zappa, Bill, Zappa. Thank, thank you for coming, huh? Let, let me tell you a joke, Bill. Let me tell you a joke. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> that, that was a good one, huh? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. Oh, oh, here comes Julius. I was going to talk, wah, 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 wah. I was also president of the youth league, wah, 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 wah. Hey, Julia is killing me. Two seconds. Julia, six times five. Okay, it's fine. It will be, it's fine. It'll be there for hours. Yeah, let's carry on. Let's carry on. Okay, we're going to drink, all of us. We're going to drink then. But before we drink, I want to propose a toast. All those people who oh, thought I wouldn't make it to 2010. Yeah, he'll never make it. He'll never make it. I'm still here, 91. 91. Yeah, 91. Even Michael Jackson died before me. <laughs> Even Michael died before me. Yeah, Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Who's bad <better> now? <laughs> From Sunday, I got past it, went in this side and went out there. I'm not uh, bitter about it all. Uh, I became better. Number one, I celebrate life. It's a miraculous healing, and today I'm here talking to you. I have a stiff, a stiff jaw, but that's mine. Uh, all my senses are here. I can still jump and dance in church and break my heels. So, <laughs> What more? What more? What more? What more? We look at religion in two different ways. Someone will shoot at my mom. She will believe that God will protect her from the bullet. Yes. I believe God gave me the reflexes to duck. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, you must, you must make sure about your court dates, though. I'm not worried. Either. No! You see, you always say that to me. Just mm -hmm. listen to me. You, I'm just saying. Please. Uh, listen, sweetheart. 
you are in control. You do what you're in control of. Yes, but that, that's but are you not in control of that? You're not in control of. Okay, uh, no, but you're in control of your dates. That's what I'm asking you. Know. You. you are because if you if you if you given it all knowing, it's your you you should know. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? I did that. I that's have, what it must be. I've done that. Okay, I've done no. that part. And you and I do think you see it is in your control. Just to show a level of interest after you've been shot in the head. Just a little, <laughs> bit of, a little level of interest. Just a little bit. Okay, no. A little bit. Okay. You know, there's, there's not many countries in the world where a person can shoot someone in the head and then get bailed. That just does, it's the most ludicrous thing ever. Those are times when you just, you, you do want to escape. Yes, you want to escape. I have tension with my love of South Africa as much as every man has tension with the land that he lives in. I don't know what would have happened if my mom died. I might have left or it might have been the catalyst that made me stay here and fight even more. I, I don't know. I do need to leave though, just for a little bit. I just can't keep going on like this without taking a break. It does, it's got that feeling. It's just got that feeling like anything can happen, you know? Like your wildest dreams can come true. I dream of becoming a waiter. I just feel like this town can cater to me. Oh, Inglewood. I'm loving it already because there's, there's references from rap songs out here. Wow. Are those Mexicans doing the garden? You don't know how strange this is for me driving in a neighborhood where there's like no walls. I mean, people will say things like, hey, I thought you wanted to get away, you know? Don't you need a break from comedy and everything else? But I just can't help it. I start off on a holiday and the next thing you know, I'm up on stage again. I just, I have to be up there. I just hope people like it. You know, there's, there's two things that make, make, it, um, make you more nervous. Is hearing how loud a crowd can be and then how quiet they can be on the flip side. Because if they can be really loud, then the silence becomes so much louder. Coming to the stage next, we have a gentleman. He's from South Africa. <laughs> yeah. So I want a big, loving, supportive LA welcome to this next dude. Let's hear it. South African native, Mr. Trevor Noah. But I've, I've realized Americans, Americans have a very strange perception of, um, of, of Africa. I don't blame you guys though, you know? It's because of the images that you fed on TV, you know, the stuff that you see of us. You just get all these UNICEF ads, you know? <laughs> those infomercials, those are horrible. That's all I've seen of home, you know? Because you've got these people and they're really gaunt and they're skinny and they're just like, you know, and they've got the kwashiko and everything and they just look as horrible as possible. They just get there and you know, they're shooting this and then Penelope Cruz will start talking as the woman's holding her starving baby in her arms and they'll come in and be like, every year more than five million children are starving in Africa. <laughs> you can make a difference if you donate $10 a month. You can donate a family's life and you can change everything. Look at this child. And they show you the kid and you know, and they go in there and I understand, I understand this is a painful thing, I understand. But I just don't understand the small elements. Why do they include that, you know? Why is it that in every single one of these infomercials, why do they always have to have these people with the fly? What is up with that fly? <laughs> I don't understand it. What is, what is going on with the fly? There's always the flies. And it's not just the flies in the shot. It's not just the shot. It's not just the flies there, but they've got the flies and they sit in a very specific place. They always sit on their mouth, like always on the top lip. 
It's always on the top. How do they get the fly? I've tried. It's very difficult to get a fly to sit on your top lip. How do they achieve this goal? I'm sitting there watching this, you know, and they always get it. It's almost like they don't shoot without the fly now. It's like, you know, it's like the flies become the watermark of a starving African. It's like a train fly. Is this one of your Disney flies? Is it one of those? It's one of those. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Get in there. Get in there and stay. Okay, we're ready. And action. Every year, more than five million children are starving. You can make a difference if you don't need one hundred dollars. It's just madness. What is it? And it angers me. It really does. I understand. There's people starving. Yes, there are people starving in Africa. I do understand this. There are people starving. But I don't, un I don't understand why they need to make us look that bad. And yes, I will say it. They do make us look bad. They make the whole of Africa look bad. They make me look bad. And they make me angry. Because I grew up in a black family in Africa. And no matter how poor we were, no matter how hungry we were, no matter what, we could still do this. <laughs>
when you see commercials for Africa or when you see advertisements or movies, you see like animals. You see animals. This you see poverty. poverty. You see um, disease. You, you see all of these things. You don't think when I told you that he was a comedian, you guys all stared at me like they had comedy there. They laughed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you go from like your experience to comedy. Yeah, I do movies by Chicago. <laughs> in life, you always choose to see things in a good or a bad way. You know, you, it's, it's, it's your outlook. It's how you choose to perceive it. So you can choose to perceive things in a positive way, even if they're negative. And for me, that's what comedy really is about. Good or bad, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about it. And you can make it funny. It just depends on how you look at it. The one thing I really appreciated about going to LA was seeing how much potential we have in this country for comedy. My, my dream for Daywalker is that it will be remembered as one of the shows, one of the many shows that helped comedians to own their destiny. I'm a kid with me. Because I want it, I gotta have it, because I want it, you see, I've been there for it all through the dirt. Everybody has a voice, everybody has something to say. That, in essence, is what guys like Mandela and Sisulu fought against for so many years, the freedom of speech. And that's what your one-man show is, it's you coming out saying, this is what I think. I've tried to tie everything up and try and make it one seamless story, I'm trying to make a chunk of my life fit into an hour. It's, it's not an easy challenge, but that's what Daywalker is. And that's what comedy is, really. I'm on the edge, but I'm blessed with enough connects that I could get some rest and I'm let go of stress. Yes. Because I want it. I gotta have it. Because I want it. You see, I've been doing it all through the dirt. But I'm on the cut of curves. Been pushing harder, pushing harder. 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 Been I want to be here building things. This is the place where I want to I want to put I want to leave my mark. Australia. Just imagine it's not so. Imagine. I was like, go, go. Oh, Andrew, help me. Because when it hits you, it makes that sound. It's just like. <laughs> Even Michael Jackson, the king of pop, died before me. 
Who's bad now? And then my dad, well, well, you know how the Swiss love chocolate. Right? So, <laughs> and I see some white people getting a bit uncomfortable. Is he gonna preach? No, I'm not, I'm not preaching. This is just the backstory. So you guys are getting a bit like, ooh, is this? No, it's not one of those. It's over in my mind. It's, yeah, it's, I couldn't be around if it wasn't for you guys. So I'm, you know, I'm not even, yeah. As, as Nelson Mandela would say, we forgive you. <laughs> So that's, so that's, so, so that was the backstory. So my mom, my mom couldn't state who my father was on my birth certificate, you know? So they just had to like leave that whole thing blank and, and, and what happened was she went back to the townships where we had to stay and then my dad had to stay in town and my mom couldn't tell anyone that the father of her child was white. So she just left everyone to their own assumptions, um, which is not generally the best choice. <laughs> Basically, people assumed that I was in fact an albino. You laugh, but it was true. <laughs> they still loved me though, they still loved me. Apparently when I got home, you know, my family was gathered around. As I walked in, my grand looked in, she like opened the blanket and she was like, ooh, how oh, shame. Ooh, little Albi. Oh, no, put the umbrella, it's going to burn. Ooh. And so I grew up, I, I grew up for a, for a large part of my life as an albino, which wasn't bad. I mean, in the township, they accept everyone the way they are, you know? I got old enough to roam around on my own, and the other albinos heard about me. They'd see me walking in the streets, and they'd see this kid, and then the rumors spread, you know? They apparently went to each other, and they started talking. They were like, do you know about him? They say there is one. He's one of us. But his hair is black. No freckles, nothing. And you can walk any time of the day. No sunscreen, no umbrella. He's the one. The day walker. They were shocked. And they came up and they recruited me. They were like, yo, man, do you want to hang out with us? I was like, yeah, why not, you know? I hung out with them. We were like in a whole crew. We called ourselves the glow in the dark. So we were just like, you know. It was wonderful, you know, it was wonderful until about 1990 when apartheid ended and the truth about my identity could come out. And then my mom told everyone in the house, she was like, you know, actually, uh, his father's white. And they were like, what do you mean? They're like, well, his father's white, so he's not actually albino, he's colored. And they were like, what? Everyone lost their minds and it was a big party and everyone was so happy and overjoyed. <laughs> so they were there and they were like, oh, oh, ah, uh, oh, ah, uh, oh, oh, he's not albino, oh, ah. Uh. It was beautiful. It was music to their ears. But then I had to go back to my friends, to the crew, you know, to the glow in the darks, <laughs> tell them the news. As I was walking up to them, you know, they were standing in the crew, like under the willow tree in the shade where we normally used to hang out. And as I came up, they were like, yo, DW, what's up, dog? Because they couldn't call me Daywalker, it was just too long. They were like, yo, DW, what's up, man? Then I was like, hey, Pacino, what's up, dog? And he was like, yo, man, what's happening? You look sad. Then I was like, yeah, guys, I've, I've got bad news. And Pacino was like, ah, ah, what is it, DW, what is it? Is it really bad? I was like, it's really bad. He's like, ah, Nivea is out of stock again. <laughs> uh, I was like, no, guys, no, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Another guy was like, yo, global warming. He's like, no, 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 it's, um, something I need to tell you guys. Um, I'm not an albino. I just looked around and there was a silence. I said, guys, did you hear me? I'm not an albino. Yeah, did that. We know, we all knew. He's like, what, you knew? He's like, yeah, we knew. Of course you are not an albino. He's like, wow, he's like, yeah. We are all not albinos. We are people. Viva TW, Viva of of TW, Amanda of ha of ha of of ha. You guys have been so great. Thank you very much for coming out. My name is Trevor Noah. Thank you. Father 
time. Every time I fall, I know that soon I have to climb. Even through the dirt, I have to shine. He is a talented young comedian from South Africa. Keep going, keep pushing, keep striving. Brother Noah! That's what it is, love life and I love to live too And I want to give all that I can give Give to them, give to you too To everybody's eating many pieces of the pie Africa, the love of my heart, the place I want to That's not because you were tired Yeah, boy, your power but I'm depending on you to be as bright as a flower who doesn't complain who don't know how cold the game but simple and Your own, cha -cha. you got your own thing. Don't let life beat you up. Just get strong with love. Just get strong with love. Let me tell you everything is sweeter, everything is near, closer when you don't give up. Don't give up, don't give up, don't give up.